Please be seated. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We've been saying this all morning, but it feels like it's finally spring, so amen to that. Um, we've been going through a series called Remembering the Goal. So if you have your copy of God's Word, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 5. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 5. Again, the series title has been Remembering the Goal. And what we've been doing is walking through the letter to Timothy from Paul here. The first, and, and we're going to get to the second letter. But this is basically a foundational piece for the early church to say, how are we going to conduct ourselves as the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth? How are we going to conduct ourselves? And what Paul starts out by saying is, you need to keep in mind what the goal is of this instruction. 1 Timothy 1.5 has been the theme verse of this series, and it says, now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So the goal of our instruction, the goal of our teaching and preaching, the goal of coming together and gathering together as a church family on Sundays and hearing and sitting under the preaching of the Word of God is love. And why that's important for us to understand is love is a bonding agent of Christians. And we've heard a lot about this, about unity in the faith. We've heard a lot about this in progressive evangelical circles nowadays. And there's kind of a, I would say, a, 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 a distorting of truth in this. But I want to remind us of that as a way of introduction this morning. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and if you are um, a first-timer here, I just want to say welcome, and I also want to say we really enjoy the Word of God. We love the Word of God. We gather around His Word each week, and we really believe in an uncompromising approach, as you'll hear this morning, so I hope you're prepared uh, to, to work through some scripture. So Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 says, Above all, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Verse 15, And let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, Paul says here, put on love above all. And the goal of our instruction is love, this, this bonding, binding agent of unity within the faith, within, within Christ followers, believers of Christ. And then he says, let, let the peace of Christ, to which you were also called in one body, rule your hearts. And then he says, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you. So you say you have the love and the peace of Christ bonding or binding agents of unity in the faith amongst believers in Christ. And it all comes down to the word of Christ that has to dwell richly among us. The reason Paul is telling Timothy now the, the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a sincere heart, a good conscience, a, a, a pure or sincere faith. The reason that he's saying that, the goal of our teaching and preaching, is because love actually binds us together. It unifies us in who Christ is. It's the word of Christ. It's the message about Christ. Remember what Romans 10 says, without faith? That we, faith without hearing. Hearing comes from the word of God, from the message about Christ. So love, he's saying, the goal of our instruction, the goal of our teaching here, love is the binding agent of the followers of Jesus Christ. But we cannot distort this and we can't say this is a love that I can produce or this is a love that I can somehow manufacture or this is an emotional feeling that I can somehow learn to wield in some way to produce this false unity. No, it's got to be based on the love of Christ. And Jesus tells us where this love comes from. Go to John chapter 17, because this is the most often used passage right now when we talk about unity among believers. 
So I want to make sure that we just, as, as, again, as we introduce this morning's sermon, and we remember the goal of our instruction being love, we need to know where that love comes from, and we need to stay grounded in it. John chapter 17, verse 20 says, I pray not only for these. This is the prayer of Jesus. He just went through this heart-pouring prayer to say to his, to, he's just crying out to God to, to really pray over these 12 disciples that he has. And then he goes beyond that in verse 20. I pray not only for these guys, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they, may they all be one, he says, as you Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. The bonding unity of the faith, that love and peace of Christ, the word of Christ that dwells richly among us when it brings us together, we are on display, folks. A gospel message for the world to see. That's the point. Verse 22, I have given them the glory you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me so that they may be made completely one that the world may know you have sent me and have loved me or have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am so that they will see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world has not known you. However, I have known you and they have known that you sent me. I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them and I may be in them. Do you see that? If the goal of our instruction is love and we understand above all put on love and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and let the word of Christ dwell richly among you and if love and peace of Christ is supposed to unify believers We need to know from the words of Jesus where that comes from. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves His followers, believers in Jesus Christ. And we are one, made completely one in them. It's not a unity we produce on our own. And the way that we continue in this is to continue uncompromisingly, unashamedly approaching the Word of God. Understanding the gospel message, the person and the work of Jesus Christ is something we have to guard. That's the title of this morning's sermon, Guard and Avoid. And we're going to go through two verses this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, the last two verses of this letter. The last two verses. Guard and avoid. What I want you to see this morning is how we are to guard the gospel uncompromisingly again and unashamedly preaching and teaching the word of God and representing the word of God. We will uncompromisingly stand on this book and we are to guard what has been entrusted to us. I want you to see this morning how we are to guard this. I want you to see this morning how we as a church should guard this. Whoever fills this pulpit for Renewed Life Church for the length or the life of Renewed Life Church, whoever fills this pulpit will preach uncompromisingly the word of God. We will ensure that as a church body. I want you to see too how Jesus guards while we're guarding what's entrusted to us, while we're guarding the gospel, Jesus himself is guarding. And then I want to look at a couple of things we need to avoid. And before we get started, let me ask you this question. And this is a big question. When we talk about uncompromisingly approaching the word of God, guarding what's been entrusted to us, the gospel, and avoiding contrasting things, things that are contrary to the word of God, avoiding them. Here's the question we need to ask. Do you know, folks, do you know enough about the word of God to avoid being deceived? Do you know enough about the word of God to avoid being deceived? This has been talked about a lot over the last couple of weeks and I've seen this graphic. Put up the next one. I've seen this one um, several, several times. 
but this is state of the Bible research. You can go to their website and pull this graphic up. If you, if you actually put your name and your email address, they'll give you a digital copy of this report. This is 2022's report, and this is the biblical ignorance, folks, of America. Look at that. Look at how far we have dropped off completely scripturally unengaged, disengaged. The reason that deception will seep into the church is because we don't know enough about this book. So I ask you again, do you know enough about the word of God to avoid being deceived? And we're gonna get through that this morning. So let's pray and then we're gonna approach these two verses and we'll pull them apart. Father God, thank you for your word. It is timeless. It is enduring forever. So God, we just thank you that you have put everything together. You have created everything that is. And you have done that to bring yourself glory. And over time, God, you produced and, and provided salvation through Jesus, our Savior. That if we believe in him, for forgiveness of sins, for salvation, if we call on his name, we will be saved. God, that's what you put us here for. The work that you have for us to do, you say in your word, is to believe in him. The command that you have given us is to believe in the name of Jesus. So God, would you just help us to understand how important your word is right now? And would you just help us to understand passionately and motivating, Father, that we have a sense of urgency right now. God, thank you for an opportunity to approach your word. Help us to just sit here, Lord, and just open our hearts and our minds to you. Work in the way that only you can. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. It says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding irreverent and empty speech and contradictions from what is falsely called knowledge by professing it, this irreverent and empty speech and contradictions from what is falsely called knowledge by professing it, some people who are hearing this nonsense have departed from the faith. And then he ends the letter, grace be with you all. Next week, I'm gonna preach a sermon about grace and mercy and peace from 2 Timothy 1. And I'm really looking forward to that grace. Oh, I've been living in the grace of God this week and we need it. Oh man, we need it. So don't miss next week. Um, but, but Paul starts out, Timothy, he says, guard what has been entrusted to you. And three pieces jump out just from that little piece. Why Timothy? How is he to guard what has been entrusted to him and what? in the world has been entrusted to him. Let's start with the what. First Timothy chapter one, Paul opens this letter by telling Timothy, not only Timothy, have you been entrusted and you need to guard this, but I've also been entrusted with this, he says. First Timothy chapter one, verse number 10. And he opens up this letter by saying, I'm urging you to stay there in Ephesus so that you, you can instruct these teachers of false doctrine. And what they did, just to summarize and refresh your memory, they took the law and they repackaged it and they repurposed it and they started to manipulate it so that they can control the masses. They were using the law against righteous people, people justified by faith in Christ, instead of using the law for unrighteous and those unrighteous things. And he begins to spell those out in this first chapter. And he says that the, the law is not meant for a righteous person. What it's meant for is lawless and rebellious for the ungodly, uh, for sinful, for unholy, for irreverent. And then he goes on and he says, or for whatever else is contrary, verse 10, to the sound teaching that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God which was entrusted to me. So he tells Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. It's also been entrusted to me and here's what it is. It is the sound teaching that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God. In other words, he's saying, Timothy, guard the gospel. 
And every time we get a chance, we need to define that word. And I always define by Romans 1, 1. The gospel is of God. Verse 3 of Romans 1. It is concerning Jesus Christ. The gospel, Romans 1, 16, is the power of God unto salvation for those, we always leave this part out, who believe first to the Jew and then to the Greek. The gospel, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, we need to guard it. And Paul tells Timothy, guard it. And then he tells him, Timothy, because you have been called to ministry, because you have been raised up as a leader in the church here in Ephesus, because you are appointing other men who will faithfully teach and carry on what's been entrusted to us, you need to understand what you're doing and guard. And he tells him throughout, you're going to confront teachers of false doctrine. That's how we're going to guard and we're going to teach and encourage. And we're going to command and teach. And we're going to preach the word of God. Being ready in season and out of season. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says we're going to teach the entire word of God. Why? Because First Timothy, or 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, all scripture, every bit of it is inspired by God. And it's profitable for teaching for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. He says, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. The reason why you, why you need to guard this is because you are in leadership position. You're raising up godly men who will also teach this sound doctrine. And then he says, how? Confront false teachers. Confront them. Then he says, command and teach, teach and encourage, preach the word, the entire word. Remember this in Acts 20, 26 and 27. Go there real quick. Acts chapter 20, verse 26 and 27. He says this, therefore, I declare to you this day, and he's talking to elders here in Ephesus. He says, Paul says, therefore I declare to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all of you. Why? Because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. The whole plan. The entire word. All of it is presented. So he tells Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. And how do we do that? If the goal of our instruction is love, if, if love is the binding agent of unity amongst believers, we have to preach the word of God. If we cut this thing out, if we cut pieces out, if we compromise on this book, if we superficially approach this book, if we preach more and more sermons about tips and tricks on how to become a better version of yourself, we will avoid the entire counsel, the whole plan of God, and we will miss it. And I said, if we don't understand the word of God, if we don't know the word of God, we will open ourselves up to deception. We need to let God's word speak for itself. That's what the Holy Spirit uses, folks, to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. John chapter 16. And if the Holy Spirit uses the word, leads and guides us into all truth, and, and it illuminates who Christ is through the word, faith comes by hearing, then we need to preach this book. Paul is telling Timothy here to guard the gospel, guard what's been entrusted to him. But he tells him the responsibility of guarding the gospel, what has been entrusted to you, Timothy, is not solely on your shoulders. Christ also guards. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11 says, For this gospel 
I was appointed a herald, an apostle and teacher. And that is why I suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. Here it is, because I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, but know that Jesus Christ himself is also guarding what has been entrusted to us. Amen? Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, you need to see this. Hebrews 10, 23. It's a big responsibility, Timothy. Guard what has been entrusted to you, but know that Jesus Christ is also guarding. And we, folks, followers of Jesus Christ, need to hear that. If you're a child of God adopted into the family, you need to know this, that Christ himself is guarding and he is holding on to us. Look at this, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. I can hold on, folks, to the confession of my hope without wavering, amen? Because he is faithful. He is actually holding on to me. Let me show you Philippians chapter three. We do get around on the word of God, don't we? Philippians chapter three. Verse number 10, and this fits right in, folks, with last week's sermon, the power of his resurrection. Philippians 3.10 says this, my goal, look at this, is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already reached the goal, that goal to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect. Look at this, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. I can hold on to the confession of my hope without wavering. I can guard what has been entrusted to me, the gospel, because he who is faithful is guarding it as well. And he is clinging to me as tightly as I am clinging to him. And this goes right into the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. We, we throw that doctrine around. And folks, we miss this in that doctrine. Enduring faith. Oh, if you don't endure to the end, are you really saved? Know this for sure and settle this in your heart, folks. God, Jesus is holding on to you. And he is amazing and wonderful. Not only is he guarding us individually, he's, a, he's guarding the church as a whole. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Not only is he guarding us and holding on to us and clinging to us, he's guarding and sanctifying and doing a work in the church as a whole. Look at this. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He said, remember this in John 17? Sanctify them by your truth. And then he says, your word is truth. Sanctify them in truth. Verse 27, he did this, past tense, sanctifying, justifying work, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He did this work. He did this, past tense, to present future tense. Look at that. The church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. He is doing the work. Hold on to him. Cling to him. He who promised is faithful. He will complete the work. One more. Turn to the book of Jude. Jude is 
a servant of Jesus Christ as he opens up his letter and a brother of James to those who are the called. That's your audience, loved by God and the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. So Jude, uh, verse 24, now that you know the audience here and the author, now to him, that is Jesus who is able, look at this, to protect you from stumbling. He is holding on to you. We can, we can hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering because he is faithful and he's going to keep us. He is able to protect you from stumbling and, church, to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. He is doing the work and will present the church to himself in glory, in splendor, without spot or wrinkle because he is sanctifying the work. He justifies and he sanctifies and he's doing the work. Paul tells Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Guard the gospel. Know that Jesus Christ is guarding what has been entrusted to us. Know that he is working don't become isolated and think that we are just doing this on our own. Jesus Christ is working in and through us. But then we got to ask. Is this just for Timothy here to guard what has been entrusted? Is, is Timothy responsible for this and Paul and we see other church leaders? Is this just for church leadership to guard what has been entrusted? And I argue this morning that the first point, if you are a Christian, folks, the gospel has been entrusted to you. If you are a Christian, the gospel has been entrusted to you. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Starting in verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us. That's that, that's that binding, unifying love of Christ. Christ. And it compels us since we have reached this con conclusion that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all. So that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Let's stop there real quick. A worldly perspective. Just think about what Jesus told his disciples. What's it going to look like in the end times? And they were asking him, what's, what's it going to look like? It'll be like the days of Noah. Eating and drinking and partying. Marrying and giving in marriage. Just going on about life. Completely ignorant to the things of God. Not even understanding who Christ Jesus is. Even some people saying, yeah, of course I believe in God. God, country and flag, right? but they disregard the, the work of God, the command of God to believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Remember this from last week? The proclamation that has to be made in his name is repentance for forgiveness of sins. And the worldly perspective that we live in right now, culturally, currently, is a complete disregard for the things of God or Christ. We don't need a savior. We don't need a Lord. I got my own thing going. And we don't know anyone, he says, from a worldly perspective. Verse 16, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Why? Because there is a spiritual and a physical, folks. And we have to be spiritually reborn born therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation the old has passed away and see the new has come everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation the gospel has been entrusted to you we have the ministry of reconciliation he continues that is in Christ 
God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Isn't that cool? We are ambassadors for Christ, ministers of reconciliation. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God is pleading and appealing through us, through Christ, to this world. Be reconciled to God. Folks, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the gospel has been entrusted to you. And what we are to do as ministers of reconciliation, ambassadors for Christ, we are to plead with people, be reconciled to God. Because there's a real judgment and wrath of God that is coming. Not only is Timothy to guard what has been entrusted to him, he's to avoid certain things. And look what he says there in our text. Avoiding irreverent and empty speech and contradictions from what is falsely called knowledge by professing it. Some people have departed from the faith. Irreverent means profane or heathenish or wicked. They have crossed a line in what they are saying. By definition, irreverent and empty speech is a contradiction to the gospel. It's a contradiction to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And it comes out of what is falsely called knowledge. This fake, phony nonsense that the world is producing. Here's our second takeaway this morning if you're taking notes. We have to know the truth Folks, we have to know the truth to recognize the contradiction. This irreverent and empty speech and contradictions from what is falsely called knowledge, we have to know the truth to be able to recognize this. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 6 says, Let no one deceive you with empty arguments. These empty arguments for God's wrath is coming on the disobedient because of these things. Therefore, he says, therefore, do not become partakers or partners with them. Do not become their partners. Avoid them. Guard what has been entrusted to you, the gospel, and avoid these things. You don't have to look around very far today in evangelical church, in church in America, in church in the world to know that there are some teachers and preachers being propped up in pulpits and they are teaching false doctrine. And folks, we have to know the truth to be able to recognize the contradictions. We have to be in our word and allow God's word to be in us. We have to hide his words in our hearts so that we can ab avoid being deceived. That's what Satan is, this, this is the tactic of the enemy. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. This is the tactic of the enemy. Satan, the devil, he is coming against the church. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church and, and the gates of Hades won't prevail against it. What that says to me is there's going to be an onslaught of attacks. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, I wish you would put up with a little foolishness from me, Paul says to the Corinthian church. Yes, he says, do put up with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to present a pure virgin to Christ. But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced. They're going to be seduced from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. 
Look at verse 4. For if a person comes and preaches another Jesus whom we did not preach, or you receive a different spirit which you had not received, or a different gospel, he says in other places, as if there is one, which you had not accepted, you put up with it splendidly. Skip down to verse 13. For such people are false prophets, false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as, look at this, apostles of Christ. Look around the evangelical church. People are popping up left and right. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And you start to see that and you start to look at it and you say, okay, let's, let's, let's take in the word, let's hear that, and let's discern what they're saying compared to the truth. Why do we have to do that? Verse 14, and no wonder. For Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no great surprise if his servants disguise themselves, look at this, as servants of righteousness. This is happening, folks, in the church. If love is the goal of our instruction and love is a binding agent of unity within the church amongst believers, amongst followers of Jesus Christ, then we need to preach the entirety of this book. We have to be able to recognize contradictions. Because Satan doesn't want to unify. He wants to divide us. And what he's doing in dividing us is he's making little factions here and there. And he's making little cliques. And everybody's divided on their doctrine and they're supporting their man-made doctrine and they're trying to prove that out. The goal of their instruction is not love. It is to prove that they are right. And what we need to do is preach this book and let it speak for itself. I think God knows what he's doing when he put it together. Second Peter chapter 2 in closing. I see y'all looking at your watches. I'm not completely done. Second Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. There were indeed, look at this, false prophets among the people. Peter's saying this, hey guys, you understand this. Look in the history of the Israelites. Just go back to your Old Testament. Look at what happened. There was false prophets among them infusing into culture and society and trying to take their focus off of really being reconciled to God. And he says, just as there will be false teachers among you, Here's what they're going to do. They will bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. Remember that from 1 John? They went out from among us because they were not of us. They denied Jesus is the Christ. They denied Jesus is the Messiah. And these folks who deny the master who bought them will bring swift destruction on themselves. Verse 2, many, this is sad, many will follow their depraved ways and the way of truth will be maligned because of them. And Peter is saying here, Folks, false teachers will try to come in among us. They will try to get people to listen to them. And actually, Scripture says that people, because of their ignorance of God, because of their lack of understanding of this book, because their disengagement with this book is plummeting, they will actually prop people up like this to tickle their ears. That's what scripture tells us. And we have to watch out for this. And I preach this way and I teach this way, folks, not because I'm worried that you're going to come in here and hear false teaching, but you better call me on everything that I'm saying by this book. Amen? I say this, though, to warn you because you can click on YouTube and you can watch a thousand and one plus more teachers and preachers and you've got to be careful. 
You got to know this word so that you avoid being deceived. Skip down to verse 17 of 2 Peter chapter 2. These people, these teachers of false doctrine, these false teachers among you, these people are springs without water, mist, driven by a storm. The gloom of darkness has been reserved for them, for by uttering boastful, empty words, they seduce with fleshly desires and debauchery, people who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption since people are enslaved to whatever defeats them. Here it is. Do you want to you guard what has been entrusted to you? to avoid irreverent and empty speech and contradictions from what is falsely called knowledge? Do you want to recognize false teachers who are sneaking into the church, those who are disguising themselves as servants of righteousness? Then we have to know the truth. We have to get into this book. We have to know this book. We have to hide the words of God in our hearts so that we might not sin against him. This book has to illuminate our path. It has to lead us and guide us and direct us. This is what the Holy Spirit uses. The Holy Spirit will, he says, lead us into all truth. He doesn't do that void of the word. He doesn't do that by just emptying your mind and sitting and meditating by yourself. He does that through the word of God. We have to know this book. God carefully, methodically, intentionally raised up holy men inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this book. It is without error. It is complete. It is sufficient. And we need to know it. Do you know enough about the word of God to avoid being deceived? And folks, I get so passionate and so motivated about this stuff because I do, I watch a lot of different people. I listen to a lot of different preaching and teaching. And I know what's popular. And I know the doctrines that are being pushed. And I know the danger. That's why I spent a couple of weeks just talking about end times prophecy from this book. I know the danger that can come from distorting this book and taking away and adding to, reading into scripture. That's why Paul tells Timothy, you gotta guard this. That's a military terminology. That's tactical wording. Guard this. Just a few verses before he said, I charge you. This is guarding, Timothy. Guard what has been entrusted to you with your life. And know that Jesus Christ himself is guarding what has been entrusted to us until that day. He's going to work. He's doing it. He's sanctifying us and sanctifying his church. He will do a good work. He will present the church to himself in glory without spot or blemish. I'm going to trust him for that. My goal, my, my job is not to unify the church. That's not my job. That's not your job. Our, we stick to this book. The goal of our instruction is love. There's no unity without the love of Christ, without the peace ruling our hearts, without his word dwelling richly among us. We need to be in this book as followers of Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, all it takes is to cry out to him, call on the name of the Lord to be saved. There is no other life. We are united with him in his death. We are united with him in his life. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. Amen? Do you know enough about the word to avoid being deceived? That's the question. And we gotta challenge ourselves with that. We gotta really challenge ourselves with that. And I want you to be in prayer. Folks, I am just beside myself, destroyed about meeting every weekend in this wonderful theater that is just warm and cozy because what that means for us is we don't have anything Monday through Saturday. We got nothing. So I want to start doing something. And this summer, I'm going to challenge you. to. We're going to start doing stuff. We're going to start getting together in the community, in community together, really learning and diving deep into this book. We're going to get our kids involved more in this book. 
So I don't care what is happening around us in the world and there's a ton going on. I don't care what splitting or dividing or causing fights among the evangelical churches. We will preach the word of God and we will stand on it. So if you know folks that are looking for a Bible preaching, gospel centered, great commission church, man, tell them. I don't do it perfectly. But we will preach his word boldly. You ready? Next week, Paul ends this letter by saying, grace be with you all. And I've been thinking about this a lot this week. We've had a lot going on in our home. But I was reminded and I got to teach one of my kids this. You cannot live through this life, folks. Hear me, you cannot live through this life without being crushed under the weight of your sin unless you have God's grace. Amen? Oh, isn't that awesome? We're gonna sing a song, Amazing Grace. Next week, as I said, we're gonna talk about grace and, and peace and mercy, opening up that second letter to Timothy, Paul's last letter. So I hope you come back and join us in that. But grace is something we need to hear a lot about, right? Because I will be crushed under the weight of my sin if it's not for the grace of God. I got stories. Father God, thank you for your word. What a quick roller coaster through your word. God, every week we just aim to please you and to bring you honor and glory to to just hold you high. And we make it our goal and our aim, Father, to approach your word respectfully and humbly because we know the goal of teaching and preaching your word, all scripture is love. And we don't have that without you, Jesus. So Jesus, we just take a minute to say thank you. And God, we're gonna sing about your amazing grace and what that is, and we just thank you that we, Father, can live in your grace, your abundant, never-ending grace, and we are not condemned because we are in you, Christ Jesus. Thank you. So, Father, we just say thank you. Would you work in our hearts, continue to work in our hearts, challenge us in this message, challenge us to really get into your word so that we avoid the deception and false teaching is picking up. You know that. So God, teach us to just approach this tactfully, tactically, vigilantly. God, just diligently teach us to approach this that way because we have a sense of urgency. We are ministers of reconciliation, ambassadors for you, Jesus, pleading with people to be reconciled. We know there's a sense of urgency about that. So Father, thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.